Okay, I think we are working on Instagram. If anyone's watching on Instagram, can you give me a high five? Oh yeah, and I think we're working on um, Facebook as well. This is exciting. Here we go. Great. Bear with me just a second. Hi, everyone's waving. How are we? Are you good? Great. I'm just going to double check Facebook because that's the one I get a bit more confused with. Ah, there's Shardy. Hi, <laughs> great. I can see the comments as well. That's really good. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jen. Um, thank you so much for joining me uh, with the Kings of Theatre Book Club today. Um, I'm one of the junior associates at the King's Head. Um, and thank you so much for taking part and still holding on <laughs> in this really difficult time. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so it's quite interesting to kind of come back to them. Um, forgive me if I'm flipping between screens. It's because I'm on Facebook and Insta. I feel like a real influencer right now. Um, so hello uh, from Coventry. I'm based in Cov. Um, a little bit about me. So I, um, I'm a freelance theatre director. Um, I mainly work with new writing. Um, I'm based in Coventry and I trained as a director on the Birmingham Reps Foundry course. Um, and I'm also an associate artist with Theatre Absolute. I've directed work at the Birmingham Rep, um, Warwick Arts Centre, um, the Belgrade Theatre, Vault Festival, the Kingshead Theatre, um, and uh, also at Assembly Venues at the Edinburgh Fringe. And I'm also the co-artistic director of Shoot Festival, which I've been running since for about six years. Um, which platforms early career artists making work in Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, I've had a few projects postponed due to the pandemic, as I'm sure all of you who are watching right now have experienced as well, um, unfortunately. Um, but I am currently working on a large scale project for Coventry City of Culture next year, which is super exciting. Unfortunately, I can't say too much more about it, but there's work happening, which is good. Um, so before we start, I'll just give you a little brief background to my connection with the King's Head Theatre. Um, so I actually trained on the scheme five years ago, um, would you believe it? And I graduated in 2016. Um, I'm one of their new juniors, uh, I'm one of their junior associates. Um, and I've also worked as an associate director to Adam, um, spread by Maya on Strangers in Between, <clears throat> which also transferred to Trafalgar Studios as well, um, which which was a brilliant experience. And the King's Head Theatre have also produced um, my production of Sorry, which was at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2018. So we have been working together for a long time, which, you know, has, has been a blessing. Um, so the play I've chosen to talk about today I've actually given myself a really difficult task because um, this, this piece is not very well known. Um, it's only been done in London once and it's also got a really complicated plot as well. So I've made things very hard for myself, but it's one of my favorite, favorite plays. Um, and I hope you enjoy um, hearing about it and feel free to ask questions throughout. Please do like type in the chat if you don't understand what I'm talking about or you need me to repeat something. This isn't a lecture. I'm not trying to give you a university education from afar. Um, please, you know, ask questions. Let's talk about the topics, the themes in the play. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask anything. Um, and, I'll, and I'll try and explain as best I can, but it's just such a beautiful piece that I could not choose it. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about um, When the Rain Stops Falling by Andrew Bovell. Um, the reason why I've chosen this one is not, it, not only because it's fantastic, but also I actually pitched this um, in my trainee director interview 
five and a bit years ago. Um, so yeah, I've, you know, it sort of goes in circles. Um, and also it's a piece of new writing, which I am, you know, that's kind of my forte. That's what I love working on. I love new writing. That's what most of my career has been based on, um, working with new writers. Um, and the second, well, the other reason is that um, it's Australian. And as um, the fantastic Adam Sprebri Maris just left the King's Head Theatre um, last week after 10 brilliant years, I thought I could pay homage to him by choosing an Australian play as well. So, um, yeah, I should let you know before we start, there are a few content warnings. So there are adult themes in this piece, um, just to let you know, including suicide and paedophilia, just, just so you're aware because I think it's quite important before we start talking about it. So um, let me give you a brief synopsis. So this is what it, so here's the play. Here we go. Um, so on, on the back, it says, um, a heart-rending drama about family betrayal and forgiveness, spanning four generations and two hemispheres. When the rain stops falling, moves from the claustrophobia of a London flat in 1959 to the windswept coast of southern Australia and into the heart of the Australian desert in 2039. It interweaves a series of connected so Instagram can see it as well. It interweaves a series of connected stories as seven people confront the mysteries of their past in order to understand their future, revealing how patterns of betrayal, love, and abandonment are passed on. Until finally, as the desert is inundated with rain, one young man finds the courage to defy the legacy. So that's that's the description sort of on the back of um, the play and also on Nick Hearn Books as well. So if you want to get a copy, it's still available and you can get it from Nick Hearn Books. Um, the image um, on the cover is actually based on, which I found really interesting, is um, based on Anthony Gormley's Another Place sculptures which is in um, Crosby, Liverpool. And I, I've never seen these sculptures before, but I'd love to go and visit them. So yeah, you see the um, the, the front cover. It, it's based on those sculptures um, as they look at our relationship with nature and, and the sea and the ebb and flow of the tide. And I thought that was very fitting for this piece. Okay, so I have written a bit of the synopsis. It's a little bit long, I'm sorry, but I felt like I needed to explain the play properly so that we could talk about it. But like I said, feel free to kind of butt in at any point and ask a question or, um, you know, make a comment. So here's a little bit of a synopsis for you. Okay. Um, also, I should let you know that Michael Billington actually described it as the connections it weaves are so subtle as to make the story murder to describe. So I really have set myself up a challenge, but never mind. OK, so the play opens to the sound of falling rain in the desert region of Alice Springs in Australia, 2039. Um, eccentric wanderer Gabriel York is waiting for a visit from his son Andrew after years of estrangement. Gabriel is keen to make a good impression with an empty wallet, empty fridge and flooding barring the roads. Gabriel has no idea what to serve his son or where to find food. Suddenly a fish falls from the sky landing at his feet. The action then shifts to the past to a flat in London in 1959. Henry and Elizabeth Law give birth to a son, Gabriel, before Henry mysteriously departs, never to return to his family again. The pivotal scenes take place in London in 1988, where the 28-year-old Gabriel Law confronts his reticent alcoholic mother. We learn that Gabriel's father mysteriously decamped to Australia when he was seven sent his son seven cryptic postcards from the outback and disappeared on Uluru, which is Ayers Rock, which is um, in Australia. I'm sure you all know it. Um, Gabriel travels to Australia following in his father's footsteps, desperate to find some connection to the man he never knew. There, in the Coorong, he meets and falls in love with waitress Gabrielle York. Gab also confusing, they're all either called Gabriel or Gabrielle, which makes things much easier. Um, Gabrielle is troubled by her own tragic past, having lost both her parents in the aftermath of her brother's disappearance. He went missing when he was eight years old and his bones were found buried in the sand. 
The story then flicks back to London um, in the 1960s and follows the disintegration of Beth and Henry's marriage. And we learn the real reason why he disappeared. A policeman visits their flat and demands to speak to Henry as he has been accused of molesting a young boy in a public toilet. Beth demands Henry um, uh, to leave or she will turn him in and vows to never mention his name to her son again. We then move back to Uluru, 1988, as the younger Gabriel plans to climb the top of the mountain as his father had described in postcards to him. He moves close to the edge, but Gabrielle persuades him to come back. As the couple travel across the hay plain, Gabri Gabriel tells Gabrielle he loves her. Gabrielle asks a question she has to know. What year was Gabriel's father in the Koorong? He answers, 1968, the same year that her brother was taken and murdered. Gabriel looks at her as the weight of this tragic possibility dawns on him. Gabrielle shouts at him to watch the road as the car veers off, off and into a tree. Gabrielle calls from Australia. She tells Elizabeth, Gabriel's mum, of the news of his death in the car crash. Elizabeth asks Gabrielle to arrange the funeral and have him cremated. The ashes can stay in Australia. Gabrielle then tells Elizabeth that she is pregnant. Elizabeth offers her money to take care of it but Gabriel wants to keep the child. And if it's a boy, she would call him Gabriel after his father. I know another Gabriel. <laughs> um, whilst the main narrative unfolds, we also flip back to Adelaide in 2013, as we see, as we see an older deteriorating Gabrielle, desperately wishing her estranged son would visit. She is cared for by her husband, Joe Ryan, who saved her from the crash, which killed Gabriel Law. We then move back to Gabriel York's room so this is the son of Gabriel, Gabriel and Gabriel, as he waits for a visit from his estranged son. After an awkward introduction, they sit down to eat. It's fish, the one that fell from the sky at the beginning of the play. Andrew has never eaten fish before. He asks his father why he left when he was so young. He's not angry anymore, but he wants answers. Gabriel then brings out a suitcase containing gifts for Andrew. He opens a suitcase and takes out items in turn. And this is when all of the ancestors like visit the um, piece, uh, sorry, visit the scene and sit there watching. Um, Gabriel brings in the fish and they admire its beauty. They all look up noticing that the rain has finally stopped falling. So yeah, so I should also add that kind of rain and weather plays a huge part in this piece. Um, it's it's definitely a pathetic fallacy. It, it, it's raining throughout, um, and that plays a really huge yeah huge role in this um, piece of theatre. Uh, I should also let you know that it, originally um, it was um, done by I think it was a Sydney theatre company, um, but it's only ever had one run in London, and that was at the Almeida in two thousand and nine. So I've never actually seen a professional production of this of this uh, play. Um, it it was um, I actually saw it at, at uni a student drama, and I've kind of been in love with it ever since. Um, it's always that one that I'll kind of pick out. Um, you know, if someone says, "Can you talk about play?" This is one that I absolutely love talking about because it's just so epic and it's a very interwoven, tight family drama. That, as you can see from the um, <laughs> my description, convoluted description, it switches through time frames. So there's kind of four main, no, sorry, five main time periods. So you've got the 60s, which is a small flat in London, and you've got Henry Law and Elizabeth Law. You then have another time period which is 1988 um, and this sees an older Elizabeth Law and then her Gabriel Law her son aged 28. The next time period you've got uh, 1988 the Koorong on southern uh, on the southern coast of Australia and this is Gabrielle when Gabrielle and Gabriel meet for the first time and then Uluru when they um, climb um, the rock um you i should also let you know if you if you don't know where the kurong is it's actually an incredible um spectacular lagoon um on the southern tip of australia and it's sort of separated from the southern ocean by sand dunes and windswept beaches 
um, and you find lots of um, my migratory war, uh, birds there and waterfowl and it's quite an incredible place but it is very much it's very desolate sort of somewhere between you know the land and the sea um, and I think for Gabrielle that's what you know sh she's grown up always living there both her parents have, have killed themselves and because of her brother going missing when she was only eight and she needs to get out and Gabriel is her ticket out this stranger from England that that's her ticket out of there um and then um Uluru also known as Ayers Rock is a large sandstone rock uh, in the southern part of the northern territory in central Australia and it's and it's quite a huge <laughs> um mountain it uh, it's also it's a UNESCO world heritage site and it's also very sacred to the Aboriginal people. Um, and it an, has an abundance of springs, water holes, rock caves and ancient paintings. So it's quite a special place in Australia. Um, so, yeah, sorry, we were on um, spaces. So we've got London in the 60s, London in the 80s, the Coorong in the 80s. And then 2013, we have a small flat in Adelaide and a nearby park. And that's when we see the older... Gabriel, uh, Gabrielle, sorry, with Joe Ryan, her husband, who was the one that found her in the crash. Um, and then finally, we have 2039, a small flat in Alice Springs, where you meet Gabriel York, the son of Gabriel Law, who died in the car crash, and Gabrielle. And then his son, Andrew, who is also estranged. Um, so the piece is around two hours. It's performed usually without an intermission. Its non-linear structure is unfolded in 22 scenes and it also features um, some really brilliant monologues as well. A critic from Time uh, described the play as featuring the most complicated time shift in dramatic structure I've seen in years due to the deliberately disorientating shifts in time frame and characters from different periods often overlapping on stage. As the drama progresses, the connections between the interweaving stories and the characters become really clear. Repetition and idioms passed down throughout the generations are devices used throughout the play. Um, and that's something that happens really often, which I absolutely love. So one of the characters, um, when the rain is really battering down on the window, says, well, um, you know, it could be worse. There are people drowning in, in Bangladesh. And this is sort of repeated throughout a lot of the, um, the scenes. And you see, it, it, you know, the play is really about kind of how family repeats itself and then how, how you know, the le what legacy are you left with? Um, it, it also looks at fam the legacy, abandonment, betrayal, inherited secrets and the search for connection and forgiveness whilst also tackling the cataclysmic effect we are having on our environment. And that's also one of the other reasons why I wanted to revisit it today is because it poses some really big questions about our environment. And 10 years ago, I think we would have, have had a very different relationship to the environment than we do now. And so I, I do think it's, you know, it would be a really timely revival if someone were to put it on again. Um, I guess the play poses at its core the very fundamental question of nature versus nurture. And, you know, are our actions driven by forces out of our control or do we have control over our own destiny? So, for example, you know, one unnatural act committed by Henry Law, so the father of Gabriel, upsets the balance of nature and successive generations of one family are torn apart because of what he did. Um, so, you know, how a natural, um, so yeah, how, how this one act affects, you know, whole generations of family. It also asks fundamental questions, I think, about identity and who we are and, you know, where do we come from? Gabriel goes on this big quest to try and find out who he who he is because his mother never speaks about his father and she refuses to say anything. Uh, oh, Alice, no problem. Um, it's called, sorry, question. P please feel free, by the way, guys, to just, you know, pop in and um, ask questions. 
So I, I'm talking about um, When the Rain Stops Falling by Andrew Bovell. Or Bovell. Um, if you haven't seen it, that's no problem. I'm trying to give a bit of a brief introduction. It's quite complicated. And it's and as it's a piece of new writing, not I imagine not many people have seen it. But I think it's absolutely brilliant. And definitely worth um, a read if you, if you can or if you need something else to read. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, identity. And it asks about kind of how do we understand our past so that we can map out our future and so gabriel's really searching for kind of his his um his past because his mother's never told him anything about his father um and all he has is these seven postcards with very cryptic messages on from his father and so that's why he travels to australia and the Kurong and then um airs rock to try and trace his father's footsteps um the other things I love about it is that it's actually really theatrical and I guess that only comes across when when reading it or seeing it but um, it's a very unique world it's not realistic um, like I said it's got 22 scenes and lots of shifting time frames so it's, it's not naturalistic in any way um, and one of the key devices it uses as it goes back and forth in time is that the scenes essentially bleed into each other so as one scene begins to end, another another character will come on and sort of begin to start that scene and then they'll sort of um, bleed off. And it, it, it is beautiful. And there's one incredible moment where all of the ancestors, so it's kind of you have the older versions of the characters and then the younger versions, um, and they all eat together eating fish soup. And it is, you know, quite an incredible visual um you know, piece of theatre, really. So it's a bit of a dream for a director, I, w I would say. Um, I guess I, I talked a little bit about the weather, but it, it really does ask us to question our own involvement in climate change, I think. Um, in an interview, the playwright said that the play depicted the relationship between a family saga and... <laughs> the Anthropocene or the end of the world so I think that's a very good way of describing what this play is about um, anyone who's just joined please do ask questions feel free um, I feel like I'm giving a bit of a lecture so I'm really sorry if it feels like that but yes do ask um, I found this quote really interesting when I sort of was revisiting it um, this week uh, the playwright said when he was asked about what was his inspiration for the piece, he said that that's such a big question. I think you have to place the piece in a post 9-11 context. There was a shared despair about the world we live in. We were all asking important questions about humanity. Laid over this sense of despair was a growing awareness about the changing nature of our climate and the possibility that we are living on a planet that one, that one day may not sustain us and that we ourselves are largely responsible for that. I became interestingly, uh, increasingly interested in the idea that humankind could bring about its own extinction. Um, and I don't know if anyone saw David Attenborough's programme or, you know, recently or have watched Extinction, you know, Extinction Rebellion and, and their journey to kind of bring climate change to the forefront um, of the political discourse i think you know this play is is really does bring up some themes in that and i've noticed in my own work as well i've worked a lot um on plays that that, that look at the changing in our our climate and i've often found that and also it's going to see work as well climate change is actually very difficult to make sexy um not that it's sexy but just to make it interesting for an audience who might not be that interested in it um because it's so horrendous because it's so big we find it very difficult to distill down and so i i think this play deals with it in a way that it's constant it's always there it's raining throughout the piece they always talk about the weather and they talk about the fact that they can't um get certain foods like fish and that the um, it's you know some of it is set in the future which is you know a very different world to um to them to what we know now or maybe it's not I don't know we've all been living through a pandemic that no one could have foreseen so 
yeah, I think it, it raises some really important questions about how we bring about our own extinction. Um, this is quite an interesting uh, comment as well from uh, the writer where he said, ideas for character emerge through a development workshop which is how I work quite often as well, which is, you know, quite interesting. Simple, simple starting points were created. Um, a son visits an estranged father, a son shares a meal of fish soup with his mother. A woman tells her husband that she wants to end her life. A girl and a boy meet and familial links emerge between these characters across generations. That was the breakthrough, that these seemingly disparate characters were all connected. For all its grand ideas, the play is also a family star saga told over four generations. A story about fathers and mothers and their children and the damage we can do to one another. And our extraordinary, uh, extraordinary resilience to, to survive this damage and for the love to be sustained in spite of it. So, you know, even though it is this kind of epic drama spanning across four generations and from 1960 to 2039 the the kind of the um this the kind of core of it is this family saga um i realize i've been talking a lot so please feel free to ask any questions i guess from a directorial point of view um the one of the biggest challenges is to kind of is to pull out that central narrative. Yes, we want the audience to work out what's going on and kind of put the, the pieces of the puzzle together, but also we need to make it clear as well. So looking at it from a director's perspective, that is one of the biggest things I need to do is, you know, the clarity in the story. Um, for me, the, the two most interesting characters are the two women, so Elizabeth and Gabrielle. They offer us some really, like two very strong arcs in the play. You know, both characters start out with huge optimism and an amazing sense of possibilities um, and life and opportunities. And then we watch them struggle as tragedy plays a huge part in their life and, you know, and how they get through that. Um, in terms of kind of design and staging, so because there's so many locations and time periods, I think from my perspective, it would need to be really simple. Um, practically it needs to be as fluid as possible um, you know and so I think one of the main images you need is is the table so when they all sit down at the table and eat soup but in terms of kind of naturalistic settings like hobs and stoves and things like that and interiors because it's just not necessary there's you know there's too much going on and for me I, I quite like clean clean lines on stage and I think you could do a lot with kind of projection and lighting um, in order to help people. Hi, more people are joining, um, you know, to help with the uh, kind of the setting of the time period. I think you, you should be using lighting and um, uh, projections to help kind of place each um, scene. I think uh, from my research, uh, the Almeida actually um, had specific rain formations for each location, which sounds incredible. So that, um... oh, Alice, great. Alice worked on Greenland, written by Maura Buffini and Jack Thorne last year, which had some of the similar themes, though more climate change and families focused. Thank you, Alice. That sounds awesome. Um, I will check that out. That sounds brilliant. Greenland. Great um thank you for that recommendation so um what was i saying uh oh the rain yeah so it rains throughout the piece so for a director no matter what scale you are that's quite a challenge to have running water throughout your play um so you know whether you're working at a larger scale or much smaller scale it's like how do you get that effect throughout the piece without a you know soaking your actors completely and also b to you know budget dependent as well so i think that's a real challenge um which i would absolutely love to have a go at the, the other thing that really interests me with this piece is that yeah i think it's a movement director's dream so i definitely look at kind of collaborating quite closely with a movement director 
Um, there's a number of moments where all of the ancestors come together and eat soup and they watch their younger selves play out moments of their lives. So I think there's a lot you could do in collaboration, yeah, with a movement specialist to help look at those moments which are not, you know, just text and narrative base where we look at kind of the ancestors coming together and, you know, some characters watching their younger selves as well. So I think that could be really interesting. I've noticed that when we're pretty much out of time, um, thank you so much to everyone um, for joining me today. I realise I gave myself a bit of a challenge to try and explain this piece, but if you do have time um, or and you have the resources, do check it out. It's absolutely brilliant. It's called When the Rain Stops Falling. Can you see it on Instagram as well? Yeah. It's by Andrew Bavell. Um, it's published by Nick Home Books. Um, there's also lots of content on the Almeida's website as well and the archive pages. So if you fancy checking it out, I really do recommend you um, reading it. It's, it's, it's just a really brilliant piece um, if you need something new to read. Um, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you all have a lovely day. Keep, um, keep your eyes peeled for... Um, other things on Instagram and, and on the socials for KH, um, you know, connected, they're still doing some great sessions once a week. So do keep a lookout for that. And also if, if anyone wants to have a chat a bit more uh, about play with me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Jen Davis five, um, feel free to follow me and send me a DM or something. And we can have a chat always up for chatting to new creatives and, um, yeah, who want to talk about plays. All right then. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, and Alice, I have got your that the name of that play. I'm going to write that down, Greenland, so that I can revisit that. I can visit that one as well. Great. Thanks so much. Bye.